Good afternoon, everybody. Today, we will have our second week lecture. As I promised last week, we will start with some review of some basic mathematics that will make it easier for you to understand and grasp the course material. So I will just spend 30 to 40 minutes and try to clarify some mathematical concepts that will help you understand what I tell you afterwards. So when we talk about functions, f of x, in general, this function could be like f of x is equal to 2x minus 1, or f of x could be equal to logarithm x squared plus 1, or sine x, etc. When you look at these functions, we know how to compute this without having any tools at all, right? This is just, what do you need to compute such a function? You just need to be able to add, subtract, divide, and multiply. So polynomials, these kind of functions are called polynomials, and polynomials can be computed. They are easiest functions to compute and to deal with. Okay? So the question people asked several hundred years ago is that can I somehow represent any function in terms of a polynomial? And that brings you to Tyler series. Everybody learned about Tyler series here, right? I just want to review it because I'm going to teach you something else using that. Just a few minutes. So what I will say is that the way I look at Tyler series is the following. I have a function f of x. And this f of x has all derivatives necessary. at the point of interest. Let's say x0. So I have a function, and I would like to, of course, I cannot replace a function with a polynomial everywhere, right? So I'd like to replace it with a polynomial around the point, assuming that if I am in the neighborhood of x0, f of x and my polynomial would be more or less the same thing. So what would be logical, what would be the logical thing to require? So if I say that I am asking for an nth order polynomial, so I would say this is fourth coefficient a0, a1, x minus x0, a2, x minus x0 square, an, x minus x0 to the power n. Etc. So how can I pick a0, a1, a2, an? What would be a logical thing to ask is, what would that be? That these two func function and the polynomial should be equal for x equal to x0, right? This is the minimum you would ask. So you would, condition would be fx0 and pnx0, they should be equal. So when you do that, what is pnx0? It is a zero. Everything else becomes zero, right? So that that immediately tells you, you find a, a zero. Okay. Then what would you require logically? You would say that their derivatives also should be equal at this point. So you would, then you would say, f prime x zero and p n prime x zero should be equal. So if you take the derivative of this, what is the derivative of this? So what is p n prime of x. What is that? This is 0, so this is a1 plus 2a2 x minus x0, right? 2 comes here and it decreases. Then you have 3a3 x minus x0 squared, etc. So what is then this pm prime x0? 
you, if you substitute x equal to x0 here, what do you get? It is a1. Please speak up, a1. OK. And if I do this again, so what is double prime of x? It is, this becomes 0, then you have 2a2 plus 3 times 2x minus x0, etc. So again, you require that f double prime x0 and second derivative of polynomial should have the same value. So you keep, then what do you get from here? This is, what is this? 2a2. So you can see that if I continue like that, after n derivative, what am I going to have? n derivative of f at x0, if I require this, is equal to n, n minus 1, n minus 2, 2, 1, a n, OK? So meaning a n is equal to n derivative of f calculated x0 divided by n factorial. So this is how Tyler series comes into life. Just asking two functions to match each other as much as possible. Of course, there are other ways of approximating functions with polynomials. They are called interpolation. So I could give you on an interval, let's say, n points, and I could tell you that I want my function and my polynomial to have exactly the same values at these n points. So that is an interpolation problem. It is, you will probably learn about that in numerical analysis courses. But a very logical way based on calculus is to approximate a function with a polynomial of n degree, and this is what you would have. So then you are, what you are saying is that your f of x is approximately equal to pn x, and that is equal to n equal from 0, or k equal from 0 to n, um, k derivative of f calculated x0 divided by k factorial, OK, times x minus x0 to the power k. So why am I saying this is approximately equal to? Because this is a polynomial and this is the function itself. They are not necessarily equal. When, when would they be equal if f of x itself was an n, poly, n order polynomial or less? Right? If it was a polynomial, degree n or less. OK. So how much error? When can I call this equal? Who, to, who knows this? Can you tell? What? Yes, excellent. So what is that? Do you remember that? So it is n plus first derivative calculated at c divided by n plus 1 factorial x minus x0, n plus 1. So what is this xi? Xi is it's called intermediate value. Xi is between where? Where? x and x0. I am not saying less or equal, because x could be more or x0 could be more, so therefore, it's in general, C is a value we don't know between x and x0. Of course, when you talk about error, you don't talk about calculating the exact error, right? If you knew the exact error, then do you have an error? Why would you have error, right? You would just correct it. So when you have this kind of term, this is used to estimate an upper bound for the error. You, can, you say that my function is approximately equal to this, and the error I make, and I use this to estimate it, is at most this much. You see, n plus first derivative of some function, for example, sine x. What is the n plus first derivative of sine x? It is either sine x or cosine x, or minus sine x, minus cosine x, right? So 
When I talk about the, this error, so I can talk about absolute value of the error. Okay? I can say that this is less or equal to maximum of maximum over C when C is between x and x0 of n plus first derivative of and then x minus x0 to the power n plus 1 over n plus 1 factorial. Okay? For example, for sine and cosine, you know that this thing is less than 1, right? So then you know an upper bound for the error. So this gives, this is an estimate to, to, of course you learn these things, but I just want to give you an insight and show you how powerful this is and how, how much make, we make use of it in electrical engineering, okay? Okay, let me do an example, a couple of examples that we will use, not just an example. I'm not teaching you calculus, so don't worry about it. In a few minutes, this will be over. So let's say f of x is e to the power x, okay? So for e to the power x, f prime of x is e to the power x. All derivatives of this, e to the power x. So if x0 is 0, then you have all derivatives is equal to 1. So the Tyler series, what we call it that in that case it is Maclaurin series, isn't it? When x0 is 0, it's called Maclaurin series. It's just nothing, nothing else. So e to the x in that case is equal to 1 plus x plus x2 or 2 factorial n factorial plus some error, right? Let's talk about sine x, and I will talk about cosine x, and that's it. Sine x is, so when f of x is sine x, then f prime of x is cosine x. f double prime x is minus sine x. Triple prime x is minus cosine x, and fourth derivative is again sine x. So it repeats. So that means you have a, you just have four different values of this. So when you calculate, the, let's say take you take x zero equal to zero again, so you have f zero is zero, f prime zero is 1, f double prime 0 is 0, f triple prime 0 is minus 1, and fourth derivative at 0 is 0 again, right? So this will keep repeating. So what happens to the Tyler series of sine x using these values? Isn't it? So here, for k equal to 0, et cetera, so you have here then what? x minus x cubed over 3 factorial plus x to the power 5 over 5 factorial minus et cetera. So the general term is minus 1 to the power n minus 1, x to the 2 n minus 1, over 2n minus 1 factorial. For n equal to 0, this is 1, this is 1, so this is x, and this is 1 factorial, okay? So this is the Tyler series of sine x. Any questions? You already took this, so I'm just, I'm going to make a point, that's why I'm telling you these things. So if you didn't understand something, Please ask me.
And for cosine x, you do the same thing. And what you have is 1 minus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the power over 4 factorial minus etc. And minus 1 to the power n um, x to the power 2n over 2n factorial. Okay? It's equal to 1. So yeah, this is 0 term, yes. Okay. Now, did you learn about series, number series? There's convergence, etc. Then you have a series like this, a n. Let's call this S. For this series, we have some convergence criteria, right? Who would tell me one? When is this series convergent? Or when is it divergent? How do we determine that? So we calculate the following limit. Limit n going to infinity, a n plus 1 over a n. Absolute value, OK? Let's call this alpha. If this is less than 1, this series is called what? Absolutely convergent, OK? If it is greater than 1, what do we call this? Divergent. If it is equal to 1, we don't know, OK? There is another criteria. Let's call that beta. What is that limit? n goes to infinity, nth root of a n, absolute value of n. Again, if this is less than or equal to 1, it is, conver is convergent. Okay? There are other ways of determining these things. So let's look at e to the x. So e to the x, you have n equal from 0 to infinity x to the power n over n factorial. So what is a n? A n is this, right? A n, of course, here, this is a power series. It also depends on x. So a n is equal to x to the power n over n factorial. So what is alpha? Alpha for this function is limit n going to infinity, a n plus 1 over a n. So what is that limit? n going to infinity. So what is x to the n plus 1 absolute value divided by n plus 1 factorial over x to the power n over n factorial. You just flip this over. Limit n going to infinity. So n factorial over n plus 1 factorial, and you have here x to the n plus 1 over x to the n. So this will cancel, and you have here limit n going to infinity 1 over n plus 1. What is this equal to? 0. It's not only less than 1. It is 0 itself. So what can you tell me? For what values of x? This, of course, this, I'm, I'm sorry, this is x over n plus 1. For what values of x this is convergent? For, excuse me? No, no, no. There is no, here everything is clear. For? For, for all finite x. For all x less than infinity, this is convergent. And it is absolutely convergent, meaning absolute value of x less than infinity, this is convergent. So this is why I told you about this. Now let's talk about, I have this e to the x. All these things we did, this is for real values of x, right? But I found out that this series is convergent for all x and it is absolutely convergent. So when you look at this here, this is real axis, right? 
So let's say for this, what I found out that this is convergent for all x on the real axis. This series is, uh, after some term, you know how much error you are making, etc. Okay. So this being absolutely convergent, that means you can just take any point in the complex plane. Okay, this is imaginary. So this means this is also valid. This is called analytic continuation. Okay, so this analytic continuation. You have a function that is analytic on this real axis. Okay, because it's convergent in this circle. It could be a finite circle. You say that this function was defined for this, but through this Tyler series expansion, now I can use this Tyler series to extend my function on a circle, okay? But in this case, the circle is infinite. It's entire, entire complex plane. So therefore, for any value here or here or here or here, this function becomes e to the z 1 plus z over 1 factorial plus z squared over 2 factorial, z to the power n, n factorial, OK? This is the complex exponential function, OK, complex, where z is x plus i, y, x and y being real numbers, OK? For example, I will take a special value of z. OK, I take z is equal to i theta, OK, something on the imaginary axis, OK? i theta, theta being negative or positive, OK? So what is e to the z on, in this case? So what, what should I do? I should just substitute there, right? So then you have e to the i theta is equal to what? 1 plus, so this was z, right? So it is i theta plus i theta square over 2 factorial, i theta cubed, 3 factorial, OK? So where are we driving it? Do you see that? So let's just compute these and see. So what do you have? i is equal to square root of minus 1, right? Everybody knows this. So what is i square is? minus 1, i cubed is minus i, i to the 4 is i square, square, so it is minus 1 square, which is 1. OK, so this is, again, we'll repeat. So you have 1 plus i theta, then this is, what is this? Minus theta square over 2 factorial, this is? Multiply, multiply, so it is, again, minus i theta cube over 3 factorial. Then what do you have? Plus theta to the power over 4 factorial, etc. So let's separate the real part and imaginary part. So what do we have? 1, so let me write real part first. 1 minus theta square over 2 factorial. Next term. Then next term, OK, so this is minus 1 to the n theta to the 2n over 2n factorial, etc. Right? This is the real part. What is the imaginary part? It's theta minus then OK. So what do we have now here? It is sine, so this is cosine theta plus this is miraculous equality. It is so powerful. It's so useful. And as electrical engineers, we make use of this so much, OK? This is something you should know very, very well. You should think about it before you sleep and during your sleep, etc. It's so powerful and useful. Okay. So 
This is Euler's identity, okay? Some people say somebody before Euler also found it, but this is Let me just give you a simple example. Let's say you have e to the i theta and e to the, let's say alpha, e to the beta, okay? If you multiply this, what do you have? In, in the one hand, you have what? e to the i alpha plus beta, right? Which is, what is this equal to? Cosine alpha plus beta plus i sine alpha plus beta. On the other hand, what is this equal to? That's equal to e to the i alpha, e to the i beta, meaning cosine alpha i sine alpha times cosine beta plus i sine beta. So multiply this out, cosine alpha times cosine beta, cosine so plus i cosine alpha sine beta, and then the other one you have plus i sine alpha cosine beta, and what is this? The last term? Minus, right? I squared, so sine alpha sine beta. So you have the real part is cosine alpha cosine beta minus sine alpha sine beta, and the imaginary part I so you have cosine alpha sine beta plus sine alpha. So these two things are supposed to be equal, right? So what do you have? Cosine real parts being equal means cosine alpha plus beta is equal to cosine alpha cosine beta minus sine alpha sine beta, and sine alpha plus beta is equal to what? Cosine alpha sine beta plus sine alpha Okay, you are, of course, very familiar with this. Your high school teacher taught you this without proving it, and you all memorize it, isn't it? But this is so easy to, did anybody see a proof of this from other means before? Proof of this identities. Because nobody proves this, but it's so easy when you have Euler's identity, isn't it? So when we talk about complex numbers, we talk about real part and imaginary part. So complex numbers are shown in Cartesian form like this. Real part plus i times the imaginary part, right? So let's say this is the real part and this is the imaginary part. So this is the complex number, z. Okay. So you can look at this like you are adding two vectors. Okay, you can look at the real part in, in two-dimensional space. You have the real part is a vector. In the imaginary part is another vector. So you, how do you add two vectors? You just take and put it on the, other, on the tip of the other one, and then you have the result. So this is the z, okay, real part plus imaginary part is this. Okay, so what is the, the magnitude of this vector? Let's call it r. So r is equal to like square root of x square plus 
pi square, isn't it? And what is this angle? So let's, let's just go the other way around. So this x is equal to, in terms of r, what is it? r cosine theta, whatever it is. And y is equal to r sine theta. So z is equal to x plus i y, that is equal to r cosine theta plus i r sine theta. In other words, r cosine theta plus i sine theta. Of course, now we know that is equal to r e to do i theta, right? This is equal to this. Okay. So let's just do some example with this. Let's say I have z is equal to 1 plus i. And I would like to compute z to the power 10. One way to do this is what? You just multiply this 10 times, right? If you are very careful and uh, you have patience, you can get the result right. But the right way to do it is to use Euler's identity. So what is, uh, what is r for this z? It is square root of 2, right? What is theta? Just look at this, 1 and 1. So what is this theta? Pi over 4, right? So you can write z is equal to 1 plus i, that's equal to square root of 2 e to the i pi over 4. As a matter of fact, can I write this here? 2k pi? I can, right? Why? e to the i 2k pi is equal to cosine 2k pi plus i sine 2k pi. What is this equal to? Zero, right? Sine of pi is zero, sine of two pi is zero, sine of zero is zero. So on the multiple of two pi is a multiple of pi, sine is zero. What is cosine at the multiples of two, two pi? One. So therefore, this wouldn't change this representation, but it will change some things. Okay, so how do I compute z to the power 10? It's just square root of two to the power 10 is i times pi over 4, 2k pi times 10. That's it. so easy. So this is, what is this? Um, so this is 2 to the power 5, e to the i. So this becomes what? 4 divided by 2, so that is 2 pi, right? So that is 2. 2 plus 1 over 4, right? Or I can just first make this 5 over 2. You are right. So this is 2, OK? So this is 2 pi plus 5 pi. So this is pi over 2, right? So that's 4. 5 pi over 2, yes, yeah, plus 2k pi. So this is 2 pi again here, 2 to the power 5, e to the i, pi over 2, plus 2k plus 2 pi, OK? So what is this? This doesn't change the result. So what is this? Cosine power over 2. 0 plus i sine pi over 2, which is i. So e to the 2 to the power 5 times i. That's it. The reason why I wrote this is to, when, I, when we get to the roots, the story is different. That matters, OK? So let's say I would like to calculate 10th root of z, OK, for the same z. So what should I do now? I take the same thing, 2 to the power 1 over 2 over 1 over 10, 
e to the i pi over 4 plus 2 k pi over 10. Okay? So that, that becomes this 2 to the power 1 over 20 times e to the power. So what do you have here? i pi over 40 plus k pi over 5, OK? So how many different values will this have? 10 different values, k equals 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. And the tenth one, you will repeat the first value, OK? So this way, so 10th root of a complex number, how many different values does it have? It's 10. As a matter of fact, they are, when you look at the complex plane, real and imaginary, you just make a circle. What is the radius of this? It is 2 to the power 1 over 20. OK? And where is the first one? It is, OK, let's say this one. OK? Then you would have another one here, etc. How many of these would you have? You would have total of, OK? Of course, if the number itself is a complex number, you do not have the symmetry with respect to the real axis or imaginary axis. But you have symmetry with respect to the origin, OK? If this uh, in even order, etc. But I don't want to get too much details of that. There is another, my favorite example that I sometimes publish it in Twitter, is a beautiful fact. So what is i to the power i? Okay, do you think, how many values do you think this would have? Okay, let's just have a look at it. So when z is equal to i, what is r? r is 1, right? What is theta? pi over 2, right? When you look at this, so it is this we are talking about. Real, imaginary. So this is theta is equal to pi over 2, right? So what is, uh, what is i to the i? So i to the i is i is e to the i pi over 2 plus 2 k pi, right? So i to the power i is e to the i power 2 plus 2k pi times i. So what is this? e to the minus pi over 2 plus 2k pi. Is this complex? It's pure real number. It is positive, right? How many values does it have? infinitely many values. For all k, from minus infinity to plus infinity, it has a distinct value. It's just i to the power of i. Isn't this beautiful? e and pi, they get together. And it's such a simple expression can give you all these numbers. Can you please plot this in MATLAB and see how dense are these? I'd like to see the plot of this, OK? For k equal to 0, 1, it should take you 5, 10 minutes. 0, 1, 2, minus 1, et cetera. Let's, let's see how is the distribution of this, these numbers. How about 1 to the power i? OK, so power of i, we know that any power of 1, we know it is 1, right? Is it? Let's have a look at it. So what is 1? And polar coordinates. What is the magnitude? It's 1. What is the angle? 0. So it is e to the i, 0 plus 2 k pi, right? So what is, what is I, 1 to the i? 1 to the i. It is e to the i, 2 k pi. So that is e to the minus 2 k pi for all k. So complex power of 1 is not 1 anymore. These are called essential singularities of the function. So when you take complex functions, if you take it's an elective, 
in the third year. I'm sure they will teach you uh, about complex functions and different kinds of singularities which do not exist for real functions. So the theory of complex functions is just a totally different planet, okay? It just opens the door of science for you, okay? It's just endless treasure. You have so many things there. I strongly recommend those of you who love mathematics that they should immediately start looking into theory of complex functions. It is very powerful and very neat. Here it is. So this, so this is like if you have z to the power z is your function, it has an essential singularity, okay? When you come to essential singularity, the function can take any value infinitely many times when you approach that essential singularity, okay? Of course, this is not a math course. I, that what else would I tell you? Uh, I want to tell you just five minutes about Riemann integral because we will use it immediately next class today. We will use it, so I, I just want to remind you that so that you can easily understand it. So let's say we have a function f of x. Okay, and we would like to calculate, compute the area under the curve from A to B. Okay, you learned this in calculus, and the proof had, must have been given to you. But I just want to refresh your memory because we will use it. What do we do? So what we do is that you divide this into subdivisions, okay? And you say that the the width of this subinterval is h, let's say, or delta, okay? Delta. And for every interval, you say that I will approximate my function with the value it takes in the beginning of the interval, okay? So my function, I take it constant here, okay? So I say that this is like a constant fixed function from this to this, okay? This is A, and this is what is this? A plus delta. What is this? A plus two delta. And in this, it is like this, right? And like this, et cetera. Here, it is now less. So what I say is that to compute this, I divide this interval into sub-intervals, okay? And it doesn't have to be equal, but for easiness, I say I divide it into n equal intervals. So I take b minus a, b is the upper limit, a is the lower limit of the integral, I divide it by n, let's call this delta, okay? So, in that case, how many subintervals do I have? So I divide it into n, so that means it's n subintervals, isn't it? So I can just name this x0 and this xn. So what I would do is that I will compute my function in the beginning of every interval, right? So here it is f x0 here, f x1, f x2, et cetera. So what, I, what would I do? Then I would say, what is the width of this, this rectangle here? What is it? Delta. Delta. Times what? What is, the, what is the height? f x0. The next one, what is the width again? It is delta. I didn't have to, but I took it equal. And height, fx1, right? <coughs> all the way, I go all the way to fx n minus one times delta. This should be approximately equal to the area under the curve, right? I didn't use a mathematical symbol. 
This is the area under the curve. Okay? When delta goes to zero, what do you expect? So when I use this is approximately equal, that means there is some error, right? Not always, but for some functions, for example, when would, you, when would you not make an error here and use this approach? If it is a constant, if it is a constant function, you would, make, you would not make any error. As a matter of fact, you don't need to take any subintervals. Okay? When it is linear, again, you don't make a mistake because you can easily correct it. Okay? So therefore, but in general, when you take, when you make this n larger and larger, when n goes to infinity, meaning when this subinterval length, the width of subinterval goes to zero, this error goes to zero. This means this becomes the, the exact value of the n. What do we call that? We call that Riemann integral, right? So that is equal to integral from a to b f of x dx, okay? Of course, why is this sum equal to antiderivative of this, et cetera, et cetera? You learned that in calculus. Did, did you learn it? Everybody learned that? Everybody took calculus too? Well, cal this is calculus fun, as a matter of fact. So, so it's very nice and important. You should make sure that you understand that, okay? So when delta goes, so this is called Riemann integral. As a matter of fact, it is also one of the most crude methods we use in numerical methods course, okay? So this is a way also numerically compute an integral, right? It's not always possible to find what is this. For example, if f of x is equal to sine x squared, there is no function that derivative of this will give you this. So there is no anti-derivative of this. There is no function that we know of that derivative of it will be equal to this. So for these cases, you use Numerical methods. Of course, there are much, much better numerical methods than this. This is the Riemann sum. This is the definition of integral. This is how you develop the idea of integral. OK. Let's give a 10-minute break, since we are going to start now impulse responses, as a matter of responses of systems. OK? How do you compute this? We will need these things. That's why I taught you this. OK? So it's. 25 minutes before 2, let's meet in 10 minutes. Last week, we talked about uh, what is signal, what is system, and why do we classify them as signals and systems. And we found out, or we discussed that, the whole nature is just filled with things some of them we call signals, some of them we call systems, and these interact with each other, okay? Now today, we will start talking about uh, interaction of systems with signals, and we will try to, we will start coming up with analytical ways and means of how to analyze the system, right? What did I say last week? I said that in, the reason why we talk about signals and systems is to model them so that we can write them on a paper, right? So when you write them on a paper, then you start analyzing them. You, you start making, you use tools of mathematics and other engineering tools. You develop systems or analyze and try to understand what's going on. So today, we start doing that. So what we worry about is this. We say that, okay, you have a system, okay? You don't know what is inside, so but you are able to input some things to the system, and you are able to measure some outputs, okay? Inputs. Input and output. Okay, we, let's say we call it xt and yt. So today, I will talk about continuous time systems, okay? After a while, I will talk about, not today, in the coming weeks, I will talk about discrete time systems. So in your book, 
discrete time system and continuous time systems, they are all discussed one inside another. I don't want to do that, okay? I want to just clearly teach you continuous time systems, and we make sure that you understand what is what, then we will start talking about how about if it is discrete time system, what means what, okay? So we will talk about continuous time system. So when you talk about this, so you have input and output and you would like to, so what, what, what would you do as, a, as an engineer? If these are the only things available to you, you are able to send in some inputs, some signals in, and you are able to observe the output, what would you do normally? You would do observations, right? You would say, okay, for this input, I get this output. Okay, for that input, I got that output. So you would try to identify the system. You would try to come up with a mathematical model of the system, right? So uh, using inputs and outputs, output observations, we try to identify the system we have, okay? So we have a system, we don't know what is in it, um, what is the mathematical model of it? We don't know, we don't know much about it, so what we do is that we are able to input and measure the outputs. So from these measurements, we try to understand what it is, right? For these tests, we use some standard signals. For example, one signal we use is sinusoids, I told you about last week. Sinusoid is, let's say you have sign a test signal, right? Test signal. So let's say xt is equal to some magnitude a sine omega t. So you use your input, uh, a sinusoid with frequency omega, and you enter it into the system and see what's coming out. So you see, if what's coming out is if, for example, you measure the output, of course you expect that the magnitude of the output will not be the same as the input, that's normal. We will not be surprised about that. But if you observe that the frequency of the signal I get out is the same as the input frequency, oh, that's a good sign. Okay, you said, okay, I, I ha it looks like I have a linear time invariant system. Okay, it has some phase change, and the magnitude of the signal changes, so there is some delay, okay, but the frequency didn't change. Okay, good, so this, this there is no nonlinearity inside, looks like, so it is a linear time invariant system, okay? But of course, one frequency will not be able to tell you too much about it, so then what you would do is that you would take this, okay, you have system, and you would just take a variable input, okay, you would change the omega, okay? You would change the omega, and you would measure your output, okay? For different frequencies, and you would plot the magnitude of the output in comparison with the input, okay? And you would measure the, the delays, phase shift, and you would try to come up with some kind of mathematical model. As a matter of fact, we will do that, okay? That's called frequency response of systems, okay? One other thing is that we will today we'll talk about is the impulse response of the system, okay? So we'll talk about impulse. So this, we postpone this for a few weeks, okay? We will talk about that in detail. But today, we'll talk about impulse response of systems. Now, let me just remind you that what was impulse? 
delta t was defined as follows. Can you tell me what was the definition of this? This is equal to 0 when? When t is different from 0, this is 0. And what else? Huh? What is it? So you did not review last week's class. So I got you. What? You know something, right? What was it? Somebody. You have to review every week when we finish our class. Please go to your dormitory or your home and review the class, OK? This is absolutely important. Do not accumulate things <laughs> till the exam time, like my children do, OK? Please review the class. And you have the videos now online. Review your class. Of course, you'll take out this part in my video, OK? <laughs> I don't want the world to watch me. But it is very important. Okay, Last week, I talked so much about this. I explained this. And it looks like nobody remembers. OK, this, but this is this integral from minus infinity to plus infinity to 1. OK? Of course, it doesn't have to be like this from minus epsilon to plus, because it is 0 everywhere else, isn't it? So the plot of it is like this. So this is Dirac delta function. What was an approximation of this Dirac, this Dirac delta function or impulse function? How do we approximate this? This is how we approximate it, OK? So it is very small width called delta, OK? Delta is like epsilon, very small. And the height of it is 1 over delta, OK? So the area, this integral, is area under this curve, right? So what is the integral of this from minus infinity to plus infinity? So let's call this, since it is not, it is not this is the ideal uh, function, isn't it? Ideal impulse function. This is an approximation of it. So when is this? So this limit delta going to zero okay? It's not exactly but assume, okay? For purpose of this course, this is what you have. Okay? Also, one other rule was that everybody, please turn off your phones. I don't want to see anybody looking at his phone instead of listening to the curse. OK? I told you this last week. Please just turn off your phones during the lecture. OK. Next time I see somebody, I'm going to just point to that person and tell him or her to shut off the phone. So this is the, today also I forgive it. OK, this is, so this is the ideal delta impulse function, and this is the approximation of it. So when delta goes to 0, this will become narrower and narrower. And what will be the height of this? It will go to infinity. But it's not going to go to infinity in an arbitrary manner. It will go to infinity such that the integral of it is equal to 1. OK. How about? Uh, integral of f of t what is this equal to you should just plot it isn't it so you have let's say an f of t like this right so this is 0 so this is f0. This is a function that is 0 when t is not 0, right? So whatever f is outside of 0, it doesn't matter. So this is like a scaling of this. This is going to be just f0, isn't it? So I can as well write here f0. Is there any difference? Because other than 0, this function is 
when you multiply these two together, everything else is killed, right? So what will remain is everything when you have f of t delta t, everything else goes away. So when you have this, it's not anymore, the integral of this is not anymore one, it is f0. OK, good. So please stop me, because if you don't understand any of these points, you will not understand the rest. So you should stop me. These are extremely simple, but extremely important to understand, because we will build our building on these foundations, these very simple elementary foundations. It might look to you silly, but you should make sure you understand them. OK, how about integral minus infinity to plus infinity f of t So the way you should look at this impulse function or Dirac delta function is that when the argument is 0, this is non-zero, OK? So let me just the definition here in general. I don't need to because that is hidden in the other one. This is equal to 0 when t is different from t0. And it's equal to 1. Integral of it is equal to 1. That's what it is. OK, so what is this equal to? So this thing, can I write here ft0? Would it make any difference? Instead of writing ft, I can write here ft0 as well, right? Because this function is 0 when t is not equal to t0. And it, is, it goes to infinity in a certain manner when t is equal to t0, right? So. Even if it is, has whatever value it has other than at the value it has in t0, it doesn't count. This will kill it, right? Oh, how do we approximate this? So you would have here t0, OK? And t0 plus delta, OK? This is just shifted. What is it here? 1 over delta, right? This is t, and this is y. So this is an approximation of, so what would this be? Delta, right? So how would I write this integral? Instead of if I use this delta here, if I have integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, I'm just writing it for ease. We will cut down on these borders afterwards. But for the time being, let's just stick with this. So ft delta OK. So what do I have here? Let me plot this. OK, this is, let's say, t0, t0 plus delta. And this is 1 over delta. And this is t. So when you multiply these two together, what do you have? OK. As a matter of fact, I'm going to do something here. I will. What I will do is that, OK. Right? This is what happens when you multiply this with that. And what is this equal to? This is equal to what? Please somebody tell me. What is this? This value here? F? F, but at this point, F T0. Very, very good. F T0 over delta. And what is this? F T0 plus delta over delta. Right? So 
when t goes to, when delta goes to 0, it is like multiplying that what is happening there inside that integral, OK? So you would have integral of f of t. So what is this? This means this, right? If I use this subscript here, it's not the idealized delta function, but it is this delta function, right? So this is equal to, approximately equal to f t0, right? And the way we write it is delta times f t0 times So this is approximately equal to f t zero. Okay. Is it clear? So what I am trying to do now is that I have a delta function called impulse function. Okay, it has this nice sampling property. Okay. So okay, this gives you f t zero here, right? So I want to approximate this with something I can play with. Okay, I just take this very narrow um, interval, okay, and assume that. The function is kind of constant there. Like, what did I talk about last class before the break? Riemann integral, isn't it? So I make narrow intervals where I assume that I can approximate the value of the function with the value it has here. Okay? So that's why here I talk about this is equal to ft0. Multiplication of this with this Dirac delta function. Okay? Assume this is a linear system. Okay? So what I want to do is that I want to take impulse as an input to the system. And so this is an impulse, meaning at time t equal to 0, I just give a very strong input. Like it has infinite magnitude but the area under it is one, okay? And I observe the output, and I call it impulse response of this system, okay? So you take the input as an impulse, and you observe the output. The output, assume that you just measure it for every t second, and you see the magnitude of it and everything, okay? So you have, this is the input, And the output is, let's say, so this is t and h of t. So you just give one impulse, and you observe all this. OK? So this is called the impulse response. Any questions so far? Okay. Now, if the input is an impulse and output is HT, what can you tell me about if Input is a delayed impulse. What would be the output? Hmm? What? What? So tell me. What would that be? 
Is it, how is it related to this one? Very good, excellent. Provided when? If it is a time invariant system, right? If it is a time invariant system, remember what I told you, like if you, have, you like people that when you give them an input, you tell them something, you get a response from them. And when you do this, when you tell them the same thing tomorrow, you expect the same response, right? So otherwise, you call them moody people. They are time-varying people, right? Systems are also like that. So if you, this input, if you, if I, if my input is an impulse now and I get HD, then if I give the same input after T minus, after T zero seconds, the response I would get would be just delaying what I have for now, it would just be delayed. The entire thing would be delayed. So if, if my response was this, if I give for this is for input, if I give input after T0 delay, I would get the same response it will just be shifted, that's all. So that's called linear time invariant systems. And as I told you last week, all of the work we do in engineering, in electrical engineering, and all the methods we develop, everything, these are for linear time invariant systems. Okay, almost all of it, 90, 95% of it. The remaining problems are also very important and they are very useful. We also deal with them by approximating them with linear time invariant systems. Because the mathematics of the other kinds of systems, they are very difficult and they vary a lot. But for linear time invariant systems, we are able to develop systems that tell us about very general things and we can classify them, we can have guidelines and everything. Okay, good. So let's say I have input delta t, and I get the response h delta t, right? And if I give another input, let's say after k delta, okay? So delta is just some small amount, I just take a multiple of it, then what I would expect is that I would get what would be the response? T minus K delta, right? You told me that. So the response would be just delayed. How about if I enter these two? Okay? So if I if my input is let's say and okay, what would be the response? Some of the responses, why? Why was that? Linearity. So linearity is extremely important. That's why. So for linear, time invariance is very important because I wouldn't be able to say this, isn't it? So time invariance is important so that I can say that, okay, if you know the response to your impulse, then if you delay it by this amount, the response will be also delayed by the same amount, so no difference. So if I add the response, of course, this is what? This is a signal that is non-zero only for t equal to zero. This is a signal that is non-zero when only t is equal to k delta. Everything, everywhere else, I have not, nothing else, right? So now I talk about the impulse, the response I will have for this will be H Okay. So can I do the following? What if I have a, an input that's called XT? Okay. 
So let's say this signal just from minus infinity to plus infinity. This I have this xt. I'd like to know the response of my system to this signal. So how can I analyze that? So I will use this approximate delta function. Okay? So I will take small portions of this. How, how, how wide are those portions? Just delta y, right? So at t equal to 0 for, for a period of delta, time delta, and for t equal to delta, for t equal to 2 delta, etc., I will just multiply these two functions together. As a matter of fact, in ideally, what would I have? Minus infinity to plus infinity x uh, tau um, delta t minus tau delta tau. What would that give me? Meaning I take this x tau, okay, and multiply it with a shifted impulse function. What does this give me? That integral is there. What does it give me? It is xt, right? So in the ideal case, this integral gives me that. But I don't have the ideal one. So what do I have? I just have this So basically, what I do is that I will write the following, OK? I will say delta times x0 times delta t plus delta times x delta times delta times x 2 delta so this corresponds to what taking multiplying the function with this delta function and taking this portion right and this portion and that portion and you just add them together okay So the general term is delta times, or let me write delta at the end, k delta k. Who understood this? Anybody understand it? Anybody understood this? Nobody understood it at all? OK. Where did you get stuck? Because I don't expect you to understand this in one shot. Okay, I will go over it. Today, this is the only thing we will talk about. Okay, but this is very important. Because you will use this the rest of your engineering career. So you have to make sure that today is the time to understand. Yes? This one? See, this is what we said. Uh, you have uh, this here. This height of this goes to infinity, right? So this function, if you multiply it with this delta, OK? So the, this multiplication. This times this will give you always one. Okay, so this is like sampling the function. Okay, so we are sampling the function. So this times this has magnitude one. Okay, you are sampling your function. You are multiplying it something with one, and you are assuming here that your function is constant here. Okay. So you are like in Riemann integral, you are taking the value of your function constant in this range. OK? Good question. Did you understand this question? OK. 
So we will arrive at something, something wonderful, okay? Using our, Riemann in, our knowledge on the Riemann integral, you will, we will arrive at something wonderful. So now I, I just, I was given an x of t. I wrote it in terms of impulses, okay? I have an x of t. I don't know how on earth I can find the response of my system to this. The only thing I have is the impulse response of my system. I measured it and just I spent too much effort and time on it and I somehow know the impulse response. So how do I find response of the system to any x of t? So here what I'm saying is that I know how impulse function, how my system response to impulses and the delayed impulses because it's a linear time invariant system, okay? I know everything about it. So let me divide my signal into many, many small impulses. So let me write my x of t as a linear combination of how many, how many impulses, how many? Infinitely many, right? When delta goes to zero, so you have extremely narrow divisions, okay, where you assume your function is constant in the initial value in that interval, okay? So the value of your function in this interval where the width is delta, you take it as equal to the value of the function in the beginning, right? So basically, you write x of t as a linear combination of infinitely many shifted impulse functions. So that's the input. But again, linearity, what's your name? You said? IBK. IBK said that because it is linear, so what does this mean? So can I apply linearity here? Meaning, I. If I calculate the response of my system to this and write it, keep it here. Response to this, all these, then I can I add them up? Because system is linear and time invariant, I can do that. So I can just calculate the response to each one of these shifted uh, impulse functions, get the responses and add them up. And that's gonna give me response of my system to x of t. Of course, if, if my representation of x of t is approximate, of course, the response of my system also will be approximate, right? So how good or how approximate is my response to the system it will depend on the delta. If delta goes to zero, then I would have the exact response for x of t, okay? Is this clear intuitively? Okay, this whole thing is that we are going to base response to any input, okay, any input, to the response my system has for impulses, okay? This is a way, this is one of the very important ways to look at it. Okay, so what will be the response? Let's call this Let's call this, what did I call it? X hat. X hat of t, right? X hat of t is approximately equal to x of t, right? So it is a model of, so I'm breaking down x of t in infinitesimal intervals, and I'm adding them up to get my x hat. So let me get the responses to these functions, okay? So what will be the response to the first function, x? So this is x zero delta. What will be my response? This will be, what was it? x zero h delta t, right? 
how about x delta? Nowhere you'll find it this much analyzed, okay? So this is, I just want to kill it for you. Okay, totally, so you understand it. So for this, what is the response? It's going to be x delta h, right? So So when you come to now k sub interval, of course you have here. What will be the response? This is not h0, this is h delta, right? to have here deltas. So if I want to find out the response of my system to the case when I add this up, what is this? What is this? If I add them up in with summation formula, this is k equal from minus infinity to plus infinity, right? It's equal to x k delta this is going to be again because of linearity right because of linearity it will be just addition of this from k equal from minus infinity to plus infinity x k delta h delta Remember Riemann integral? Okay. Remember we had f function, right? F something. F x i. So isn't it the same? When delta goes to 0, so when limit, so let's call this um, y delta of t, okay? Limit delta going to zero. So the interval becomes narrower and narrower and my, the height of this rectangle goes higher and higher, right? It goes to infinity. But because of this delta, you also multiply it with delta so it doesn't go to infinity, okay? This becomes what? Okay, just call this tau. And this is the tau. Okay, so this is yt. Of course, when delta goes to zero, this also goes to from minus infinity to plus infinity, x tau which is x of t, right? So x of t leads to this output. So this is a marvelous result. If you know the impulse response of your system, you can get the, the response of your system to any signal by calculating this integral. This integral is called the convolution integral, okay? So I have a habit to ask proofs 
in the exams. You might previous students remember, right? So why not ask this to see if you really, and so that's why you need to ask. Watch the video over and over and ask questions. You have to understand this. To understand linear time your systems, you have to understand how come you, you have this relationship. So if you know the impulse response of a system, if a linear time you have a system, then you can get the response to any input by calculating this integral, which is called the convolution integral. OK. Who understood this? By understanding meaning, I'm not asking, I'm going to ask you to come and here teach it. I'm sure you are. Who understood the basic idea? Who understood the basic idea? Good. Where did you get lost? OK, please. Yes. After we, you see, linear time invariant system, linear systems have this superposition principle, meaning if response of my system to this is this, and this is to this, one by one, if I input this signal, I get this output, right? I enter this, system, this signal, I get this output. So linearity tells me that, OK, if you add them up, you will just get the addition of these results, OK? Meaning, in mathematically, how, how do we say that? If your system, linear system, OK? For x1, you have output y1, one by one. For x2, you have output y2, linear system. Then we say the following. Any linear combination of, if it is an input, then the output will be, of course, this is true for two signals or one zillion signal. It doesn't matter. Okay, So any number of signals, if this is a linear system, you can just, this proposition principle is true. Okay, So therefore, this, we already know this, right? This is the impulse response of the system. This is the response to approximate impulse. That's why we call it H delta T. So when you take this delta, go to zero, this becomes the delta function, and this will be the, also the response to that ideal delta function, OK? So we are working with this. So each, for each one, we have. These are just the shifted version of the original ones. You just add them up. Because why are they shifted version? Because this is a time invariant system. Okay? If you take the same input and just delay it in time, and now no other change, then the response of the system will be exactly the previous one, but just delayed the same amount in time. Okay? Any other question? So we add this up. This is the total input. Right? Of course, this is like uh, you have an input that is non zero here and zero everywhere else. Non zero here, zero. Every, this is like a sampling function. You are sampling your signal, OK? And yet then you are superpositioning them together to again put together your. So you are analyzing it and putting it together again in a nice form. And what you are saying is that response to this. Each individual can be added up, and this is what you get. When you take t go to 0, this is just nothing but Riemann integral. Here, t is just a parameter. Okay? You can assume t is constant. For every t, you assume you do this. Okay? So this is just a Riemann integral. That's it. This is the, uh, the width of the rectangle. right? This is the height of the rectangle. So for every term here, you have area under a rectangle. You add them up, and then this is what it is. This is your function. You just need to take the antiderivative of it. Who else understood it now? So how many people understood the principle now? OK, good. We are getting better. OK, so Albanian girl, ask us, how did you like it? Is it clear? OK, OK, good. Any questions? 
Okay, let me do an example. Let's say I have a system, okay, linear time invariant system. When the input is impulse, the output is, of course, by definition, impulse response, response is e to the minus t, let's say, okay? For this system, I would like to know when x of t is e to the 5t, okay? What is this x of t? This is yt. What is yt? So from what we learned, we should be able to do this very easily, right? So yt is equal to, for let's say this is for t greater or equal to zero. I will just multiply it with unit step function, okay? Unit step function. So yt is equal to what? From minus infinity to plus infinity, Okay, this is also, let's say this is also ut. Minus infinity plus infinity, x tau h t minus tau d tau, right? Just the formula. So let me just substitute. x tau is what? e to the 5 tau u tau. And this is? e to the minus t minus tau u tau tau u t minus tau d tau. So this means what? What is u step function, you remember last week? U, hmm? u t is one when t is greater or equal to zero, zero when t is negative. This is called unit step function. Please review the course, unit step function. If you do, it will be very easy course. If you just wait till the exam time, you will have extreme difficulty. I can assure you of that, okay? Unit step function, because I will ask proofs. I'm not asking you to memorize anything. This is just something that this is your electronics engineers, system engineer. You have to learn these things by, you have to just digest it fully. Okay, this is such course. So, can I just make this zero? Does it make any difference? Because this is ut for negative values of t is zero, right? So therefore there is nothing here. So I can just put it here. How about here, u t minus tau? So this has to be what? This is what this is telling you that if the argument, if what is in here is positive, this is one, right? Otherwise it's zero. So that means t minus tau, if this is negative, then this is what? Zero. So that means this is zero when tau is greater than t. So what can I say here? This should be what? Tau should be less than t, right? Otherwise it is, right? Because of this, these two conditions, and I will tell you in a minute, these are very important things. I didn't put them there by accident. They have important implications, okay? So we cleaned out the integral, okay? So we need to just solve this integral, and I'm sure all of you can do this in five seconds. So what is this from integral from zero to t, e to the five tau, e to the minus t minus tau d tau. In other words, e to the five tau, e to the minus t, e to the tau, d tau. Right? 
So e to the minus tau can come out because it is a parameter. So e to the minus t to the minus t from 0 to t. So e to the 6 tau d tau. And that is 1 over 6 e to the 6 tau from 0 to t. Okay? So that is equal to 1 over 6 e to the minus t times e to the 60 minus 1. Multiply this out, 1 over 6 e to the 5t minus e to the t. My e to the minus t, I'm sorry. So, so this is the response of our system to this signal, right? This could be also cosine t, sine, anything. This could be any signal, any input signal. As long as I know my impulse response, I can find the response of my system to that one. Let's observe it. So output has e to the 5t. What is the origin of this e to the 5t? It, would, it, is, it is the input. It's coming from the input, right? E to the cause of e to the 5t is my input. Okay? So input has e to the 5t, therefore output also has e to the 5t, of course, with different coefficient. How about e to the minus t? That's not a part of the input. What is that? That is from the inner structure of the in the structure of my system. So my system generates that, OK? In differential equations, when you are solving linear differential equations, you will have a homogeneous solution, and you will have a particular solution, right? So this corresponds to your particular solution, solution that uh, Satisfies the differential equation when you have the right hand side, so called, right? In differential equation terms. And this is the homogeneous solution that's coming from the internal modes of the system, okay? Okay, I told you last hour that we talk about. Uh, we try to analyze and understand our system. And uh, we try to model, identify our system using special inputs. One of the examples I gave you was sinusoids, right? And I told you that when I input a sinusoid and I observe the output, and if I see that the output is a sinusoid with the same frequency, I am happy. I am happy that this system does not have a nonlinearity. So the frequency of the output is the same as the frequency of the input. It, the magnitude will change, and there will be some phase difference, but it will not add a new frequency. Of course, provided the system is a good system, meaning it's a stable system, meaning the system by itself does not generate some unwanted signals. Okay, I will define, I talked about stability of system last week. Now I will quantify it. OK. So that is, you would look at the output signal when you are doing frequency analysis or sinusoidal analysis after a while, meaning if it is a stable system, this will die out e to the minus t. After a few seconds, the effect of this in the output, when t gets large, effect of this in the output will be Zero. It will just quickly disappear, right? But if this was, instead of e to the minus t, if it was e to the t, then it is an unstable system. The signal that you get at the output will not depend only on the input, but it will also be corrupted and destroyed by the, by the system itself. The system itself generates unbounded outputs, which will, even if you're input is a bounded input, 
you will get unbound outputs. We call them unstable system. And I will tell you how they are related to the signal itself. Let me give you a five minute break so you digest this, just five minutes. Then I will talk about some properties of uh, impulse responses. Now we have, let me just, so LTI system, okay. So this is a linear time invariant system. And what did we discover now, uh, last lecture? We discovered that if you know the impulse response of this system, you know everything about it, right? So impulse response of the system reveals all of the secrets of this system. So you identify the system, right? So you identify what the system is. Of course, is it easy to determine the impulse response? Of course not, okay? But it is, but impulse response is extremely important and it has other meanings when as course develops, it will just a common, uh, common word you use all the time, okay? So it is a very important concept. You will never forget about it, I assure you of that. Okay, so we said that yt is equal to minus infinity to plus infinity x tau um, this, let's say, impulse response is ht, h t minus tau d tau, okay? So, as a matter of fact, this is also equal to Let's prove this. Why is this true? Okay? So convolution of x and h is the same as convolution of h and x, right? So how do you just this is just you just take this integral minus infinity to plus infinity. In general, let me call this uh, x convolution y, okay? In general. Let's say we have two signals after all, right? H is now a signal, isn't it? H is the impulse response, so it is, it's a signal, X is a signal. So in general, if you have X convolution Y, what we are saying is that Y convolution X is equal to this. So these are equal, okay? Prove this. This is called um, anyway, I couldn't remember the <laughs> English word. Okay, so proof. So minus infinity to plus infinity, this is equal to x tau y t minus tau d tau, right? So I make here change of variable. So let me call this, let me call this u, okay? New variable name, independent variable. So what is minus d tau is equal to du, right? And what is, what is tau is equal to? Tau is equal to t minus u. Okay, so this integral then equal to what? So when tau is minus infinity, what is u? Plus infinity. When tau is infinity, what is u? minus infinity. So integral is reversed, right? So x t minus u y u and what is d tau is minus du. So if I flip the ends of the integral, what happens to the value of the integral? It becomes minus, right? So integral from a to b f of x dx is equal to integral from b to a f of x dx. So this minus is here, we are flipping with this, then I have 
from minus infinity to plus infinity y u x t minus u du. Oh, is it the same? No, it was tau and now it is u. Is it OK? It's called dummy variable, isn't it? In integral, this, is, this tau is called dummy variable. So it doesn't matter what you call it. It just doesn't come out. It's just something to use within the integral. So this is. So convolution is commutative. Okay, commutativity. So like multiplication is commutative, but is matrix, matrix multiplication commutative? No. So everything is not commutative, right? So addition is commutative. 2 plus 5 is the same as 5 plus 2. But subtraction is not commutative, right? 2 minus 5 is not equal to 5 minus 2. So convolution is commutative. It doesn't matter where, it, what this means is that it doesn't matter where you put your t minus 2. You can, whichever is easier for you, you just can put it there, OK? So this is equal to so this is This is like distribution of multiplication over addition, right? So how do we prove this? It's very easy. So x convolution y1 plus y2 is equal to integral from minus infinity to plus infinity x tau y1 t minus tau plus y2 t minus tau d tau. Just multiply this out, this integral from minus infinity to plus infinity, x tau y1 t minus tau d tau plus plus infinity x tau y2. Okay, before that, y2. Okay. So I can just separate this integral into two pieces. I just went ahead of me, OK? x tau y1 t minus tau d tau plus so this is x convolution y1 x convolution y2. So convolution is just star. So this is how you prove this. And these are, of course, trivial. Even no need to repeat the explanation. Okay, is enough. So I will see you next week. So please make sure you review and come back with your questions and watch the video.